Hello, everyone. I'm uh, really excited to be doing this, Antti. I, I've, personally, for me, venture capital, my favorite part of venture capital is working with extraordinary entrepreneurs and getting to learn their story. Antti is no exception. And at Benchmark, we get the opportunity to work really close with Antti. And I, I really, I think the best place to start is maybe just telling people what RoboCorp is. We heard a little bit before just now, but maybe from your own words, what, what RoboCorp is. OK, um, so at Robocop, we do something called RPA. That's really not a household tech name. So it stands for Robotic Process Automation. It's not real robots. It's actual software bots. And, and the point of that is to automate hundreds of different, not thousands of different types of um, routine work that people do across enterprise companies. So think about entering orders into an ERP system or you know, working on a, on a healthcare system. So, so anything where you connect um, multiple different information systems together that humans you do by hand, we can build digital workers that then go and automate that work for people. So it's a very broad um, industry in a way has been emerging in the past five to six years here. Yeah, I mean, before being in venture capital, I had never heard of RPA before. Uh, and and I, every time I dive into it, the use cases are just endless. I, maybe it's helpful just to give context of how you even ended up in the RPA world. Like, what, what's your story there? Because for me, I, I, I wouldn't have been something I'd known about unless I'd studied that deeply. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it's a long story. I, I'll tell you that. Um, so my background is in software. I, I've been a software engineer. Uh, as already mentioned here, I, I started off with a project called Robo Framework. That was a QA test automation framework. So while I was doing software, uh, the company that I was running with, with some partners, we did consulting work. We ended up using Robo Framework quite a bit for the, for the QA parts of the projects. And uh, you know, that was an open source community that was growing up. It was a lot of the core people were in Helsinki. So I got to know them, got to be part of the community, but still global things. So, so we had you know, companies like Salesforce implementing their QI with Robo Framework. Now, it's just a cool thing to be part of. I think like an open source community, being part of it, you know, hosting events, you know, thinking about how we can grow the, the community. And uh, so you know, QA, test automation, and RPA happen to be similar on the, on the sort of the fundamental level. So both things use applications. One uses to validate it, one uses to drive a business process. So, so on, the, on the sort of foundation level, the actions that the bots take are the same. So you know, it was one of these things. I was at an um, alumni event at my university, and I saw one guy on stage talking about RPA. I was like, what's that? It's like, huh. So that seems interesting. Like, you do that? I, what's the outcome? And it's like, um, I actually just clicked in the head, like, I, I mean, that's something that we already do here. So, I mean, that would be interesting to learn more about. And so RPA at that point was sort of painted at this magic AI thing that would sort of watch your work on, on your desktop and then automate it away. And it's like, mm, I think that's kind of BS. I, I, think, I think if I would go deeper into that, I'd, I'd actually find something that's more close to test automation. So, so I started exploring, started basically cold calling people to, to come to the office and, and learn more about RPA. And this was back in 2016, 17 timeframe. And, and so, so when I actually drilled deeper into how it was used, what kind of use cases were being deployed, I, I found out it's not actually magic AI box. So it's actually the same thing we're already doing. So, so coming from an open source background, I thought that, OK, these are these monolithic, massive enterprise tools, you know, clunky and, and brittle and all that. Couldn't we do that better uh, through an open source foundation? And, and sort of um, started on journey getting the community first excited about RPA. And, and you know, really, I just sort of had this moment in time where I was maybe driving into the office or whatever. I, was, I, I just realized that if I don't bring this open source tech into RPA, maybe, maybe nobody will do that. So I kind of felt compelled in a way. And then, then started working towards that and tried it out. And it seems to work, but you know, it kind of had a bunch of things missing. So, so I figured that we need to start a company to kind of make it complete. Yeah, I mean, you have a unique story in that this happens. And you know, I, I know the story more intimately because we've talked offline. But you know, when you 
get this idea, and you're like, okay, RoboCorp is going to be a thing. I'm going to start it. What happens next? Because you know, there's there's the one path of okay, I'm going to build this in, in Helsinki. I'm going to start this all, and and then maybe raise money. What do you do? Because it it is different than than maybe the conventional wisdom. Yeah, I mean, so when I kind of understood that we need to build a company around it, our competitors, you know, UiPath, Automation Anywhere, Blue Prism, they raise you know half a billion each or so. So it's like. Okay, we're not going to be able to bootstrap this thing. Most likely, we we need some capital, and then putting one to one, one on one together, and so I realized that, gee, I mean, I I think you know we we need to learn about venture and 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 kind of figure out how we could you know attract some investments. So so when we launched the company, it was. Um, the, the first moment that I got the chance to do that was January second, uh, 2019, when I when I had my previous company been acquired, and I was I was kind of through my earnout. We incorporated that. We've actually incorporated in the U.S. from Finland. Um, got, I, I was scheming to do that in, in 2018, and then <laughs> finally got the team together, and then got to incorporate the company, and then you know basically started building a, a, a prototype of, of all the things that we need to put together to make it a, sort of an enterprise scale and and just uh, booked a flight to San Francisco and, and started meeting people you land in San Francisco and you literally didn't know anyone is that right yeah what happens next do you start going to like meetups or how, how do you end up meeting investors I mean, yeah. I mean, they don't really take cold emails from from <laughs> unknown people, so um, that that's sometimes worse. But I mean, I, I just tried to figure out how to how to meet with some some investors and happened to bump into um, you know a, a VC partner at an at an event. It was the first week there, and I got invited to the office and and did the worst pitch ever, and and. Lucky for me, they they were so kind to introduce me to other VCs in the in the network. So it's kind of spread out from there, and you know, I, I took meetings like four or five meetings a day for a few months. And um, you know, I think I, I had a spreadsheet of of all the all the VCs that I met, and I think I I spoke with uh, probably like 50 different firms. Wow! And, and and you know, Benchmark was fortunate enough to lead that seed round. When did you eventually meet Peter? Like, how, how did that eventually happen? Yeah, I mean, I already had a few term sheets at that point. It was, you know, late in the in the in the fundraising, so I I'd attracted some uh, initial supporters who helped me out. Sort of, you know, you know, basically said that, hey, I'm in for a million if you get a lead. I was like, what does that mean? <laughs> um, uh, and they just started helping me out, get get introduced to to new people and. And eventually got a term sheet and a second term sheet. I was ready to sign when when Peter Fenton reached out and 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 they most likely had been searching for an open source play in RPA because RPA at that point was the fastest growing segment in enterprise software three years in a row. So there needs to be a better way to do that than than the sort of the first generation of companies were doing it. So I think it was through through an exercise of of you know this category might be you know good for open source they've been searching for it heard about it from somebody else reached out and and i was already ready to commit to a term sheet at that point so so we we just ended up doing a 6 a.m phone call uh he was in paris i was in london um and we we spoke two hours on the on the on the phone on a zoom meeting um then spoke with the two other partners the same evening Eric and Chaitan uh, on another call, and then did the investment committee on Monday, and and they sent the term sheet on Tuesday. So, wow, yeah, I mean we're we're incredibly fortunate to to be a part of this journey, and and you know you, you've mentioned it a few times around open source being sort of the the real opportunity here. How do you look at the Gen One companies in RPA like the UI Pass, and and why is open source so critical to that? Well, I mean, in a way, um, you know, when you build on top of an open source foundation, you get to leverage a lot of innovation from the community. So you get to combine and, and, and mash together this, you know, everything coming from, you know, the Python ecosystem, for instance. So, so you, you kind of leverage uh, a lot of existing uh, foundation in there. And 
to me, as a, as a sort of an you know engineer myself, I think open source is the sort of the fundamental the right way to do software. But at the end of the day, if if it doesn't amount for a better product, uh, the, the customers w won't really get. Sure, there's some you know customers like some financial institutions that want to leverage open source more, but. I, I think it's, uh, it's sort of a, a being able to um, be open for innovation through the, through the network that, that makes open source such a, such a good platform to build on. And then obviously we are an open core company, so, so we have the foundation on, on open source, but then we lay on top of that a SaaS solution that makes those bots that we build uh, able to operate in an enterprise environment, deploy them, govern, monitor, maintain. So, so it's kind of a figuring out the, the right open source commercial model as, as well. Um, but you know, things like uh, GitHub Copilot, for instance, uh, when you build on open source, you actually have Copilot that knows how to you know, write our code instead of being a sort of proprietary black box of UI path or something like that. You, you really don't have those benefits. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. I, and, and just another interesting piece within this journey is you raise that seed round, and from my understanding, or from what I remember, that's early 2020 or, or right around? It's 2019, actually. Okay, okay. Late. like end, end of 2019, a couple months later, COVID hits and, and takes over. As you're scaling out the company, you have to make this really important decision. I think at the time you might have still been in uh, San Francisco or at least coming back and forth. Do you end up saying, hey, we're going to build a company in Helsinki, we're going to go all the way and, and, and move the company to San Francisco, or do you decide to go remote at that time? What, what's the next step? Yeah, I mean, the first instance was, instinct was, first of all, make sure that we have capital to operate. So the stock was in free fall, and we, we just start our OG. We might actually need to extend this thing if, if, we, if we go into a you know, brutal recession, which didn't happen, but at the time, nobody knew. So this is sort of the wisdom of the day. Just react super fast, raise additional capital, make sure that you can operate for two years or so. And, and then when, when the sort of dust settled, everyone is in, in lockdown. Uh, we were already remote uh, on, on the baseline, so it wasn't too big of a difference for us. And so, so I just, you know, you know, figured out that this might be six months, a year, two years, for for a company that's un, like a year old. That's eternity. So we just decided that we we're gonna operate as this would be forever for us. And so we we set out the company as a fully distributed operation instead of like fully remote where you have central location and then you have remote location. We want it to be like distributed. Uh, the headquarters officially in San Francisco. We have an office here in Helsinki, but we hire people across right now nine different countries and just built the culture from the beginning around that and, and you know it's been working out. Obviously you need in, in person interactions and now that you're able to travel it's it's, it's much better for, for everyone. But uh, I mean it's hard to kind of go back and well not even go back, go to something that you never had, which is an office culture. So, so for us, it, it works. And it was like a one decision to, to transition that way. It, it's interesting that you say San Francisco is the headquarters when, when you're based in Helsinki, correct? Yeah. It, it's, it, how many people are in San Francisco, let's say? San Francisco proper, we have one person. <laughs> and, uh, and you call that the headquarters? Uh, yeah, yeah, the CMO is over there. He, he picks up the mail, I think, <laughs> from the office. But um, yeah, that's a headquarters. That's, that's where the, the main address is. But you know, there's a small office there, a slightly bigger office here. But I stayed in Helsinki when, when everything started going to lockdown. And so, so when, when things opened up, it didn't make sense to all of a sudden move around and, and things were working. I, you know, it took many years, but when we grew as a company, launched the product, started, started building up sales go to market team in the US, um, engineering product in Europe, um, we already landed our first enterprise customers in the US. And, and, and when we kind of came out of COVID, you know, I had a functioning executive team in place where I wasn't all of a sudden needed every day in the middle of the night on a call. So, so it was, we, we kind of, sure, if, if I would have done that without COVID, it, that maybe would have worked out different. I, I would, would have moved somewhere, maybe East Coast or wherever. But, but that, that forcing function of COVID makes it so that we had to build the company that way. And then all of a sudden it works that I, I can stay here. 
Yeah, I, it's got to be interesting for you because you really do have to work across all these different time zones. You know, you have people in the U.S. and I think you said nine different countries. Is, is there yeah, nine different countries. So I, I, I'm always impressed that you're even able to balance all that. Are there any major lessons so far from that of, of operating fully remote, or is there anything that you you think you would change based off of how it's been so far for you? Mm, I think the main lesson is is that you know obviously you want to get people together. It, it, despite of working fully remote, sometimes come together. That's that's pretty obvious. Everyone understands that. Um, if you onboard somebody new you really need to put in the work. If, if you bring in a new VP to your team, you want to make sure that you're you know, joined from the hip for like a few months and that's just really put in the hours to, to, to make sure you know, meet in person before that and all, all of that. And then customers, obviously customer acquisition wise, um, it's much better to go just in person there, meet them up. It's actually funny when we kind of came out of COVID lockdown and we were finally able to go and meet with some of these customers and we walk in and say, gee, this is a huge place, like a <laughs> Fortune 200 category company. It's like, wow, we actually sold to this and we were successful in implementing it. So you, you kind of didn't even realize that you were kind of punching above your weight, weight a bit when we <laughs> were doing that from your you know, home office. Yeah, you just touched on something interesting as well, which is just around that go-to-market motion. You know, there's there's a lot of different ways to build an open source company. Mm. What have you found is or success in from a go-to-market motion? Yeah, I mean, I, I think the typical assumption in open source is that you build a project, you get you know as many GitHub stars as you can, and and then boom, something happens. Um, you know, in, in our space, it's is, is a bit different. It's B2B, SaaS, enterprise. So it's, it doesn't have the sort of, a, you know, viral um, bottom-up motion in a way which would, would be kind of expected in, in, in many ways. Uh, so, so there, you, you kind of get the benefit of having a sort of thing that everyone can try and sample out, but you still have to close it top, top down. So these decisions are made by developers themselves. For sure, something that you know a developer can pick up and, and use immediately and, and integrate into a product. That's great. With us, they they can you know uh, train themselves, get get successful. But we have to close the deal top down, or we have to use some of our partners to do that. So, so in a sense, it, it sort of feels like a more traditional enterprise sale um, than a sort of an open source, you know, maybe a PLG type of motion. But uh, you know, at the end of the day, you really need to just find the right kind of motion to your to your customers and and the product without trying to you know go into a a pigeonhole of of uh, I'm an open source company, I need to do this or that. Uh, so, so it's, it was a lot of experimentation. We we thought it might work bottom up, but you know, ended up realizing pretty fast that you just need to go top down in in order to close the deal. Yeah, I mean, you are obviously going up against the Gen One giants, and and they are all massive. They have major customers, and in a lot of cases, you're going head to head, or you might even be convincing them to leave one of those other platforms to to go to RoboCorp. For you, it feels like so much of your journey is actually just around like ambition and trying to take down these people. When when you actually, you know, in those early days, you didn't know anyone in venture capital, you didn't know anyone really in the startup scene. What do you think drove that? Like, what what from from your side, you know, being in in, in Helsinki and and looking around, and, and and you and I have talked a little bit about like you weren't even that involved in the startup scene at the time. And so, mm -hmm. what what convinced you that oh, I'm going to take on the giants in this space? Uh, yeah, I mean, that's a good question. First of all, um, I wish I knew the answer in 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 a way. Um, so it's a weird thing because. At the same time, I saw something happening in the industry, a trend, new trend emerging, and I had some exposure to that. I had some, some tech that I could leverage, and I just thought that if I'm not going to do this, you know, it's not going to happen. It is, it was, it's all in front of me in a way that just felt so compelled to do it. And so I, I kind of didn't see any option. Like, there wasn't an option like, not to do it. Um, I, and then, um, like, why go to Silicon Valley from Helsinki? Why go head to head against the big ones? Like, I, I don't know if there's anything like, why would you waste your time doing something where you want to start off with being a niche regional player or whatever? It's like, for me, it didn't make sense if you, if you want to 
you know, do something, why not do it on the on the highest level possible? And and one obviously, if you want to become the open source standard in RPA, you don't do that by by just you know sitting in a comf comfort zone in a, in a way. So. It's like I actually never asked that question from myself, but it's so sort of obvious uh, in, in many ways. You've put together obviously an incredible group of investors around you, and you've I think now raised over thirty million dollars, and, and you're in a really incredible spot as a company. You know, you chose to work with Silicon Valley investors. How has that impacted in, in some ways from your side, or how do you think that's helped shape uh, the company from that side? Um, yeah, I think it's shaped the company in many ways. I, I think you know when you start out journey like this, you're, you're pretty clueless. You know, you don't know anything about anything, and and you know, working with a, a Silicon Valley VC obviously, you know, sets your expectations the right on the right level. Uh, so so you're not aiming for a small win. You're obviously aiming uh, aiming for something huge, and, and that was something that I wanted to do. So I kind of find a, found a partner that that. Is on the same same sort of um, level with with my ambition there, and then you know when you start out uh, as a you know here Finnish founder you don't you know we are typically like very good at, at tech and, and and execution and 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 all of that but you know aspects like marketing how do you sell to an enterprise how do you manage the sales cycles and all that like there's not that much knowledge around that here so. Obviously, then uh, my, my investors have been able to bring in some of the, that those learnings that have been sort of proven time and time again in the in the industry, and and you sort of learn a lot of things that you didn't even know that you 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 were missing. Yeah, I, I mean, I imagine from your side, it, it's been just like really. I mean, you're 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 just constantly learning and growing. You know, from the go-to-market motion to hiring to you know all of those things, I, it feels like the past three years have just been a constant sprint. What can we look forward to from RoboCorp in, in, over the next three years? Right, we, we've obviously in the, the first uh, early innings of it all, and I know your ambitions is to work on this not just for you know three years; it's it's ideally decades. How do you think about the future of, of RoboCorp? Yeah, I mean it's interesting to look at this, the sort of the path from an idea to a first team to you know first product launching, then figuring out go to market raising funding, all of that. The, the sort of the focus as as a founder throughout these stages is shifts, and and now is is very much on on, on customers, product, uh, you know investors obviously, and but you know where we want to be in, in in the next three years is obviously. Um, Right now, we we have sort of cracked the nut on the on the go-to-market motions that we have place in place. So it's it's, it's partly by, driven by direct sales, but mostly around partner ecosystem that we build around Robocorp. So so right now, it's really doubling down on the on the partner ecosystem, make sure that we have the right you know assets and 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 uh, systems in place that allow them to get successful with our product and and take it to as many customers as possible. So. So next year is going to be about uh, you know scaling sales. Uh, we have pretty ambitious targets there, and getting the partner network in the right place. And then uh, then you know after that it's going to be Series B, and and uh, you know hopefully the, then we can scale up, scale the organization a bit. It's right now just 50 people, 52 or so, so it's fairly compact, and we want to stay that way until we kind of like hit an inflection point where we know that okay now we can pour more capital and and to fire fire you know. Just grow the fire, and so in three years, like, geez, it's uh, I know what's happening next quarter, maybe. So, <laughs> so that, you know, you have this like one-year plan and a half-year plan and a quarter plan, but three-year plan. I don't know if, if that exists. Yeah, I mean, I imagine if I asked you that back in 2019, you you would have. I, I think you'd be really proud of where you are today, and I think so much of your journey is just around this ambition and grit. When you know you you didn't know what you didn't know, and you just embraced that, and and you surrounded yourself by some incredible people, and you've built an amazing team and an amazing company to date. And really, I just want to thank you again. Like it, it's been just amazing from our side, from Benchmark to to work with you, but also to just hear more of your story. Yeah, it's, it's been an amazing journey, obviously. And somebody actually said to me uh, a few weeks back that, you know, when you when you start off, you might think that you know any capital is capital. You just need some money, and and you might you know a hire is a hire. You you just need people. But but if you get the best people, the best investors, the the angle of of growth just like 
changes and, and then a few years later you're sort of on different planes from the ones who compromised in the early on. So we were lucky enough not to compromise in the early on. It's like part of it's just luck, I guess, to meeting up with the right people. You might say it's luck, but I, I think a lot of it has just been hustle and grit. And, and really, it's, it's just amazing, an amazing story. And I think we are still in the first innings of it. So I look forward to looking back in, in you know, 10 years and, and even just rewatching this and seeing how far the journey's come. So thank you again. Awesome. Thank you.